we here at Artsy Window had the pleasure of visiting a dope space called Flower Shop Collective. Flower Shop Collective is an art and fabrication studio that cultivates the ideas of emerging artists working towards more equitable futures. Their goal is to help artists of all skill levels execute their ideas, learn new techniques, and have a safe space to do so, with a prioritization on immigrant artists, artists of color, and women identifying artists. También les ofrecen todos estos servicios en español. For more information, head to flowershopcollective.com or flowershopcollective on Instagram. Go check them out. Welcome to AW Classroom, where we interview artists, visionaries, and magical beings in the art world, doing their thing, growing, learning, making art. <laughs> Today, we are here with Albany Andaluz. Before we start this interview, I'm going to put a disclaimer that Albany is in DR and our rooster friends are in the background, so y'all are going to get the full Dominican experience with this interview. <laughs> <laughs> but I love it. I love it. It's sound art at the end of the day. So, <laughs> Albany, can you introduce yourself? How would you define yourself as a creator, as a human, as a person? As a creator, I identify as, like, you know, a multidisciplinary artist from a contemporary lens you know I mostly in my visual art practice because I have various uh, mediums that I work in that's visual art there's painting photography sculpture and, um, and sometimes video you know? through the multi through the visual lens there's that and um, they're all intertwined but they all have the are informed by my culture, the cultures that I've learned about, the cultures that I've um, had the privilege to be exposed to, which are my cultures, which um, I'm Ecuadorian Dominican. But um, in my visual art practice, I like to refer to it as it expands the identity of, um, of being Dominican or being Ecuadorian. It expands it to the the, the, the geographical <laughs> geographical um, historical context of the Caribbean, let's say, in, in, in relation to Dominican Republic and of Mestiza in, in relation to um, Ecuador, because that those are the cultures, those are the geographical contexts to which they pertain. So when I'm speaking about my visual art, I like to refer to myself as Caribbean and Mestizo just to, um, to reference those backgrounds and, uh, and, and how they relate to one another and how they also um, juxtapose uh, against each other, if, that makes, if, if that's clear. I make stuff, but um, yeah, everything that I make, it has a personal context. Um, it's, it's personal, but... I, but I do. I'm a, I'm, I am part of that school of thought that believes that the personal is political, or that or the personal is universal. So while some things may be personal, I always look at it um, in a universal lens. Like, how does my experience? Uh, um, how can I learn from my experience, and how can that learning benefit others? Or how, what is the universal in in my experience? Like, I'm a human at the end of the day. Like, we're all humans. That's how we relate. So. I see myself as a vessel, as a vessel um, that learns and shares that those learnings in, in, in many forms. And one of those forms are through my visual art practice that is very informed by like my Dominicanness, my Ecuadorianness, and also my Dominican Ecuadorian Americanness <laughs> of being born and raised in South Bronx in low income housing housing projects also that that informs my work and also like the progression of that um into other social classes if, if that's clear did i answer that question yes there... yes so i want to go into the beginning of like i guess your artistic journey even like growing up 
were you always in like drawn to like, art drawn. And, yeah. and yeah like tell me how that yeah. unfolded yeah unfortunately um it were like in that phase of my life like right now I feel very fortunate to be um to have always thought that way or have always been interested in this because that's where I am now but in my youth it was like I, I think for me, it was very unfortunate or like <laughs> I felt misfortunate um, for having that particular interest or pro proclivity because I grew up in, you know, low, low income housing projects and it made me a, a big, a big time weirdo <laughs> um, in my neighborhood and in the, in the schools that I was in. Um, I never really felt like I belonged um, because because people just didn't understand my, my way of viewing the world, my way of viewing uh, suffering, my way of viewing happiness, my way of viewing myself. Um, I was like very much bullied, bullied um, and I was very quiet. And, and yeah, there was um, like to add more of a personal context, I, I was also like, I also went through like physical and psychological abuse in my home, witnessed domestic violence. So all of that, uh, it 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 kind of put me in a position where I didn't feel like it was safe to create. You know, I didn't feel like it was safe for me to express myself because of um, what I witnessed or what I observed was that the consequence of expressing myself in my authentic, um, authentically, or the consequence of that was um, stigmatization or the consequence of that was being ostracized. The consequence of that was um, being bullied. So, so back, back in those days, it was very misfortunate <laughs> or like unfortunate you know, to see the world in that way, uh, who were my age. Like, I remember one time, like, this guy told me, like, you don't act your age. Like, you, somebody's just, like, an old woman or something. <laughs> like, and I was, like, what, um, 20, 20. Um, so, so, yeah, uh, that was what I felt when I was in that place in my life. But now I see that that was um, such a beautiful experience to have, like to go through that um, dissonance, to go through that com like time of conflict and to be able to come out on the other side, to, 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 to have the tenacity to continue to pursue this, to continue to be interested in this, to, to continue to entertain this as a, as a viable form of living. It, it's, it's so beautiful uh, now that I see it in hindsight. <laughs> and now that I'm not no longer in that place, now that I own it. <laughs> and can you tell me a bit more about your the first experience where you made something with the intention of it being a work of art? Like that you actually like got materials and you're just like, yo, let me make this. <laughs> oh, um uh I don't even remember. Oh, 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 okay, okay. <laughs> um, it was during, in high school, in high school, actually. Um, I was dating, like, this really toxic, um, <laughs> this really toxic person. <laughs> but uh, but um, we broke up, and I, he also just, happened to be an artist you know um and that also like you know got me back in tune because i left it for a long time after like my parents divorced so after they divorced like i kind of like left it like left creating for a long time and um i was in high school and i would just spend the periods that i was in school because i barely went to school in high school like i would I would go when there were like two periods left. If you're young and you're watching this, please stay in school. Don't be like me. <laughs> but um, but yeah, I would be in English. I was in English class. I remember exactly, and I still have the drawing to this day. 
um, and it was just a pencil drawing, but um, it was like this woman and she was blonde and she had like this third eye. And at that time, I didn't really know much about um, about um, consciousness or Eastern philosophy, but that was like the first thing. Oh no, no, that wasn't actually. It, the first thing was this um, big pen drawing. I love drawing with big pens. Like, they're like the best things to work with in my opinion. Like all the fancy stuff is cool, but a big pen, the texture of that line that comes out, oh, I love it. And it was um this man, this man, um, and it was like the head of a woman in the shape of like a mist coming out from the vision of that man. And um, and yeah, that was like the first thing that I drew. And it, it was like very surreal. It was very surreal. I think I always had a, um, a strong like inclination towards like surrealism. Yeah. That was like the first work of art and, and people loved it. Um, but a teacher that I didn't um, have as a teacher, but she was the art, she, she, she was trying to convince me to submit it to, to, this, um, to this contest. Yeah, um, but I didn't because I was scared at the time. <laughs> Yeah, I was I wasn't ready to expose my art to the world yet. Yeah. Too, too sensitive. So, and then I want to come into, I guess, your journey of like the mediums that you're using now, and how it's like a variety of things. Because when I think of Albany, I don't think oh, just a painter or just someone who draws or you know what I mean I think of like how you also sing and you make music and you work with a lot of different mediums like textile pencil <laughs> like painting um so yeah like how did you come into like this very expansive way like of making now um I mean I wish I could tell you it was a process of, of like intentionality, <laughs> but honestly, like that's just the way I think. I, I just think very expansively and I, I feel, I feel very expansively. And sometimes I feel like um, the medium that I'm working in doesn't really translate what I want, if that makes, if, if that's clear. Um, Sometimes I feel like there are certain mediums that help me, for example, in photography. Like, that is very immediate. It's writing a song. That is very immediate for me. I can write a song in, like, 15 minutes if I'm inspired to do so. But with painting, um, the things that I want to paint, they are so labor-intensive and time-intensive that... Um, uh, doing all the other more immediate forms of art. Um, drawing takes a little longer than the other ones. Um, sculpture depends on the, the, the occasion. But painting, for the things that I want to paint, um, the vision that I have in regards to painting, it, it's just so labor and time intensive that I have to do the other things um, to, uh, to kind of um, diffuse the energy while I um, and also so that I don't, like, I realize that when I paint something, if I am too focused on that painting, then I find that I force it. I force things that don't need to be there. I, um, I add more than needs to be there. Or sometimes I, I just get um, unmotivated just because I, I've just been on the same thing for a long time. I think it's healthy for me as an artist to take space from a work that I've been working on for so long. Like for example, Santa, Pobre Diabla. I started that in, in October um, and due to classes and stuff, uh, I wasn't able to progress um, last year. But right now, what, what are we in April? I've been working on it um, for about four months, you know? So I need to be doing other things while that one is progressing or else um or else one I wouldn't be as um 
prolific. <laughs> and two, um, my energy was would just be too concentrated and not like, uh, and I'd, I'd, I'd make some mistakes or I'd, I'd make some decisions in that painting that aren't suited for that painting. Um, I think that makes more sense for somebody who is painting, uh, but I think there is like this element of mystery um, for uh, the, the, the people who are an artist uh, to, to understand like the process of making a painting. Like how is it that um, you know when it's done and stuff like that. But yeah, I try not to force the works. And while I try to not force the works, I have to you know make other works so that I can get back to Oh no. Let's see. So I can get back to it and um, not not worry about it, you know. I totally like understand what you're saying with that. It's like I don't know. Every time I find myself on a project that I really need to focus on, because I know that it's a big project and it's right. going to take like a long time, you mm -hmm. know. The first step is like getting yourself to focus and like, okay, I'm, I'm going to take this project step by step, you know, all those things. But there are some times where I find myself a little bit too obsessed <laughs> or a little bit too much on the, on uh, honing in on like the feeling of, I want to get this done um, or trying to like force the focus that is just like, I might as well not even work on it at that point. I might as well like step back and do something else, <laughs> then come back to it with like a fresher mind and feeling refreshed and having, you know, the right energy to, to keep working on it. Because if not, I feel like you're just kind of like sabotaging yourself and you're not serving yourself at that point. Yeah. You have to kind of like, I don't know, like break, break the code. Like it's like break natural. Break the code. Like, like it's like natural. Break from that and then come back to it. Yeah. I feel that. And um, that part, like, precisely, like, you explained it perfectly. And that part where you said um, you're not serving yourself, but, yeah, you're not serving yourself. And when you're not serving yourself, you're not serving anybody else. Like, I, I see it that way. Like, if I'm not serving myself properly, then that transmits to, like, my sphere of influence, let's say. And, like, all the people who are in my life, all the people who are in my network, all the people who are in my community that also transmits and um, and I don't serve the people who I want to be affected by my work if I'm not serving, you know, the vision or, or myself to, 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 call, to call the vision, you know, connected to me. <laughs> I think I just like over complex, uh, um, over complicated it. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want to go into um, the big move to Mexico and like, <laughs> I know it's like, the thing is when I was, was thinking about this interview, I was just like, oh, like, I want to talk about your experience in Mexico, but um, if you could talk about it and like their, your decision behind uh, yeah, going yeah, there yeah, and yeah. how it affected your practice yeah. and what you learned. Okay. Definitely. Um, well, I'm a Sagittarius. <laughs> um, and if you believe in sun signs, my moon is also um, a Sagittarius. So I, I love adventure. I love travel. Um, I've always dreamt of living in other countries. And Mexico, when I visited about uh, four or five years ago, uh, it was definitely a place, well, particularly the, the region that I went to, which was um, uh, the Yucatan, which was, um, Merida, a city called Merida, which is so beautiful and so safe in comparison to the rest of Mexico. Actually, a lot of people flee from other parts of Mexico to, to find like stability and security there. Um, so like you could literally jog in the streets and not have to worry about um, a lot of as, as much um, like the violence that are in other parts of Mexico. 
and like, you know, the drug problem that are in other parts of Mexico. Um, so when I went there and I, I spent like 10, 10 days there, I couch surfed. Uh, and that's like this like online platform where you just find people that are willing to host you for free. And one, it was like cost effective. Um, I, I was balling on a budget. Um, and when I first went there and of course like, I got, I try to, I try to be like, I try to live below money, my means. Um, I was on a budget when I went there and I was, and I also prefer to have a local experience. Like if I go visit a country that I've never been to before, it's nice to see all the tourist attractions. Um, but the thing that nourishes me more is to learn about the culture, uh, to learn about the people and how they live their everyday lives and, and the things that they say and the foods that they eat and why they act certain ways. And, um, and that also has, gives me the privilege to be able to, to morph into like whatever culture that I see surrounding me. Um, and that was one of the places that I wanted to live in. And I lived there for six months. At first, I was I was there by myself. I was in like a studio apartment living by myself. And then I thought, so that I, at that point, I thought that I could live by myself and be happy and be like, you know, and be like a hundred percent. But then through that, I learned that no, like I need I need to cohabit with other people. Like that was that is a human need that I have. Um, mildly attractive so like I also like I had to downplay you know that that attraction because I was like in like a low-income neighborhood I didn't know that it was low income because like they hooked it up they hooked up that apartment but outside of it it was very it was very busy not a neighbor and uh, just that whole process of like learning about the culture through going to somebody's house and like you know just starting off with a hello how are you doing good morning and you do that consist. I did that consistently, and then, and then it ended up turning into relationships where I would be invited for Christmas and to, to eat, or I would be invited to a memorial that they had for a deceased relative. The decision to move to Mexico was because I had a dream, and I am a stubborn little bitch that needs to follow her heart and needs to follow her dreams. Um, for as much as I wish I could conform, for as much as I wish that I could like, deny myself those dreams, it's, I have to follow those impulses. And it wasn't an impulse, actually. Like, it was something that I was like strategically planning for, for like three years. I was like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna work this teacher job and I'm gonna save all my money. It's like, I didn't go out to eat with friends. I acted like I was always broke. And, um, and yeah, it was, it was with the intention of moving to Mexico. It was with the intention of moving to Mexico so that I would be, I'd have the time to, to create the things that I knew that I need to create, which is like very labor intensive painting, um, that will get me where I need to go. But I couldn't do all of that if I was still living in New York. Personally, because um, just the energy in New York, it's just always so vibrant and um, stimulating that it just isn't, for me, the perfect environment to create those kind of labor-intensive works. It's, yeah, so I knew that I had to move somewhere else where, like, the pace was slower and people were more chill and I wasn't, and I would also have the excuse of, oops, I'm not in New York, I can't do that. <laughs> you know <laughs> so so all of that and plus like the cost of living in other places it would also afford me more time in that aspect you know to not have to worry and I, I love it I I want to go back but I don't want to go back alone this time I want to probably friend or something like that but, but yeah it was it was really nice living there and I met a lot of great people um, I'm actually working on a project still within the city in like a main avenue in the city. So 
So yeah, so yeah, I definitely have some unfinished business there. Like, I want to ask you, like, where you are now. Like, where you are now. And I guess, like, what is your intention just, like, moving forward with, like, yourself and, and your practice? And I want to create, I'm creating this body of work that will, with the goal, with the intention of, you know, being represented by, by a gallery. Where I am in terms of being a person that makes art, like, outside of, like, that career goal, I just want to create art that everybody can see themselves in, like, to democratize the experience of being in, in an art museum, in an art gallery. I, I have the goal of making sure that anybody can understand their own, have, have a read art in their own kind of special way. I remember when I was starting out as an artist, when I would go to museums, I would go to galleries, and I, I would feel like this, this, this connection. I would feel like I would understand the work and so something was wrong with me and not just the fact that there are some works that just don't affect you, you know? Um, so, so that's my goal as an artist is to, um, is to, is to bring together things that don't belong together and in, in works um, don't socially belong together and to make them live, coexist harmoniously. Um, low, low brow culture, high brow culture, um, uh, low income classes, working class and, and, and elite, elitism. Like I, I want, I want that tension to be there. Um, because I think that that ten through that tension, like, uh, so much can be resolved or so much can be, can be learned or so much can, can be influenced. So that's my goal as an artist and as a person is to make sure that there is that tension um, and, and to make sure that everybody from all walks of life um, can see themselves, can, can see something in the work that I make. What is some advice you would give to young artists right now? Um, just, just make without, without the, just make and make, don't think, just do. Don't think, just do. Think less, do more. That's something that I had to tell myself in the beginning a lot. I thought that if I thought more that the work would be better. And, um, it just so happens sometimes that the things that took me the easiest were the easiest for me. That's the things that the people like the most. And I was like, really? Like, I didn't even think about it too much. But this was a hit, you know? Um, so think less, do more. Um, and when you're doing more, I know there's this pressure right now to market yourself, to market yourself as a brand. There's this pressure right now um, to professionalize yourself way before you're ready. Um, don't worry about that. Don't worry, worry, don't worry about looking for your style. Don't worry about marketing yourself. Don't worry about selling your work right now if you're starting. Just make as much as you can when you can. And it will unveil to you what it's trying to say. And your work is going to speak to you. And when you look at all your work together, after you have thought less and did more, then it'll start to make sense what your work is really about, what you're really about. Um, and then it'll make all the other stuff way, way easier in the long run. More way in the studio, which I think is very important, especially today, um, because there's a lot of um, politics and art these days and i love it i love the tea i love the tea i love the historical tea i love um thinking about the future of how we relate to one another um but i also worry about how that's affecting the sense of joy and and how it's affecting the spirit of art 
I care a lot about the spirit of the artist. I care a lot about the spirit of the work. And to me, I have learned that the best work that I make comes from a place of, 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 of trying to find joy or trying, trying to um, find beauty in, in the struggle, trying to find beauty in the tension, trying to find beauty in, trying to find beauty and trying to make joy out of it. Um, yeah. And last question, because I was contemplating on, I don't know, usually I steer away from these questions because it's very like rooted in like the future. Mm. And sometimes when you're like thinking about the future, it could take you out of the present. But all of us kind of envision something for ourselves in the future, like how we want to feel. I'm going to ask the simple question, where do you see yourself? in the future where do i see myself yeah. in the future? i see myself yeah. doing what i'm doing now like i see myself living in other countries um and and painting it's it's it was really that simple um and painting and, and making music um i see myself <laughs> uh studying music in india <laughs> i see myself um but yeah, like it's, it's really that simple, like to just make my art and you know live in other countries and you know be back and forth between like you know the meccas of art and and where it's like really quiet and where the life is slower. Like I just ha I have an appetite for or I have an appetite you know for for slow paced environments. Even though I'm a city gal that needs to be constantly stimulated, like that's why I have my phone. You know, I got my phone. I can always like stimulate myself by me saying, but yeah, I, I just have this craving, you know, for like familial settings, for for people who don't take life so seriously, for those kind of environments. So it's just simple as that, you know, just just make my art and 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 meet new people, um, find community wherever I go, kind of thing. Yeah, and gallery representation, you know, gallery. Oh, true. I need True. I need all the representation galleries. If y'all watching, exactly. check out the work and talk to me. <laughs> yes, yes. All yeah. right. Well, it's in the air now. I'll keep an eye out for you. Hey. You know. Mm -hmm. And but I feel you. I feel you on that in terms of like, and that's where I, even for myself, I'm thinking of like because most of my shows have been institutional shows because I think with the institutional stuff, it's very it's like more like education driven. It's like a different intention behind it. And then with the commercial, it's like okay, of course it's about selling the work because of obviously like the galleries need to pay rent and all this stuff and like all yeah. that stuff. Um, but how can I also yeah just work in the same way in the same intentional way, but in the commercial world and also practice more of like a business mindset. Cause there's nothing wrong with that, you know, there's nothing wrong. So I feel you. I feel you. Mm -hmm. So what, what was, was good with this performance? <laughs> okay. Now with the performance, I'm going to put the computer outside. I'm excited too. I'm a little nervous because um, I haven't done a performance. Really? Yeah, I haven't done a performance. I mean, I've sung on stage. Yeah. Uh, but I haven't done like a, oh, a long performance. But okay. let me follow my own advice and yes. be glad and do more. Yes. <laughs> do more than I think. Yeah. <laughs> when you say advice <laughs> for other people, but you realize it's really for yourself. Really, <laughs> really though. It's me all the time. I'll catch myself saying some advice, and I'll be like, "Oh wait, I should actually, this is what I needed to hear." Exactly. That was me when I was teaching my kids. I was like, "Really, I need to follow my own advice." <laughs> all right. So for this part of the episode, we're gonna have AW Classroom Podcast first ever performance live y'all already know what it is so here is albany andalus performing two improv songs and albany you could just take it away i'm very very excited okay 
okay. By the way, I have um, a collaborative partner, which is this rooster. Um, and and he may he may pitch in, you know. So yes, I just gave you your credit. Okay. <laughs> vocals, vocals, vocal, vocals. The rooster next door. Revolution. 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 Revolution, revolution will not be televised. Revolution will not be televised because it's happening right here. It's happening right here. It's happening right here. It's right here on Zoom. Right here. Right here on Zoom. Right here. Right here on Zoom. And on my. Hello? The revolution. The revolution. Yeah. Okay. Revolution is, will now be televised for it's happening right here and now, and here and now, and here and now, and here and now, and now and here, by you and me, and that rooster over there, the revolution will not be we televised because it's happening right here, my dear, right here, my dear, right here, my dear, my dear, it's happening right here. Right here. This love is otherworldly. This love is so damn pure. Love is so much 
lovelier than anything I have endured before. I thought love was control and self-betrayal. Then I found that love was just accepting. Acceptance of what is and acceptance of what's not. Acceptance of what is and acceptance of what's not. And all the rest that we pay love at. Well, that ain't really what love is. Love is simply acceptance of what is. As it is, as it could be, holding space for what could be, not latching on too tight to any outcome, just being here, enjoying the presence of a loved one. I thought love was possession. And I thought love was controlling. I thought love was a battle between two sides of different poles. But love was none of that, no. Love was something more. <laughs> At the very same time, it was the simplest thing to hold. <laughs> love is acceptance. Love is nothing more. Love is nothing less than. Be willing to explore all potentialities. I've seen it in my heart and head, but nothing compares to the love that's here when we're present. And I am here, and I am waiting on you, dear. When you're ready to receive everything that you've been giving. <laughs> they said it's the end. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, oh my gosh. I have no words. No, this really this really felt this really felt like a moment. Like it really felt like oh my gosh, like a museum is gonna hit me up for this video like years from now. <laughs> see for this performance and then the rooster it was just it was just vibe it was very like raw energy and i'm so grateful that this happened uh, thank you opportunity yeah thank you thank you thank you